The question is this. Should we follow our hearts? Should we follow our hearts? In this day and age, you're going to see Christians that are just full of stubbornness. You're going to see them go contrary to counsel, contrary to wisdom. We live in a perverse age. Perversity is going to do the opposite of what somebody tells you just to show your stubbornness. But the Bible says the curse causeless shall not come. Watch these people. Watch the stubborn and see the curses that come upon them. Mourn for them. Mourn for them. Dear Father, we do pray that you would help us this day to not be of that stubborn, foolish, prating crowd of scorners. That you do help us. Be wise. To hear wise counsel. Even if it goes against the culture, goes against our tradition, goes against our feelings. Now be with us today, Father, as I preach. And we thank you for the Holy Bible, which is our only infallible guide. In Jesus' holy name we pray, amen. Look at my text today, Proverbs 28, 26. He that trusteth in his own heart is wise. Is that what it says? No, is a fool. So there you go. There's your answer already. There's your answer already. He that trusteth in his own heart is a fool. How do you trust in your heart? You use it as a, as, as a light to guide you. He that trusteth in his own heart is a fool. But whoso walketh wisely, he shall be delivered. Now, you think of your physical heart. What does it mean to trust in your own heart? That's going to be the question. Whatever it means, you're a fool. You're a fool. So you can take everything that this culture teaches you and has taught you and you can dump it. For he that trusteth in his own heart is a fool. The decision that you will make that is going to be the wrong decision is because you trusted in your heart. You trust in your heart and you make foolish decisions. You end up in destruction. What does the heart mean? Online Etymology Dictionary says it just means the inner part of anything. And that's all the way from early 14th century in English. It means the inner part of anything. So, he that trusteth in your insides, whatever is in you. We see this with other things other than human beings. Look at Exodus 15. The depths were congealed in the heart of the sea. What is the heart of the sea? It's the inner part of the sea. Uh, deep down. Uh, Matthew 20, it says, As Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, that was his body, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Where did he go? He went down into the tomb. His body did. He was there three days and three nights. So, part of the earth, under the uh, not, not under the earth, but in the earth, in the earth, the inner part of the earth. Webster's 28, 1828 says that the word heart comes from the Latin word core. We use the word core in this way today, the core of something, the core of an apple. Webster defines it as the inner part of anything, the middle part or interior. Well, this is going to be enlightening to you because when you read Bible verses about the heart, it's the inside of you. And you need to understand that there are some things inside of you that you should not follow. It doesn't mean follow everything inside of you. This English word core is related to the Greek word card. So today you speak of a cardiac arrest. Card, card, as in heart attack. Macmillan Dictionary blog says cordial is also based on the notion of warm, friendly feelings emanating from the heart, while the noun cordial was originally a medicine to stimulate the heart. So we see the, the root here of cord. So Webster goes on to define the heart as anything inside of man. 
So you will see definitions from Webster that will say it's the will, it's the affections and emotions, it's the intellect, it's your thoughts. It all depends on the context when you're reading the Bible, what it means by the heart. Man can be divided in your will, your reason or understanding, and your emotions. When the Bible defines or uses the word heart, you need to look at the context to try to discern what it means. Sometimes it just means generally anything that's inside the person. At other times it's more specific about a certain part of you in the Bible. The popular idea today is that the heart is only a reference to your feelings or your intuition. And that has caused much trouble. Because people take that idea that they get from movies and pop songs and they read the Bible with that definition of heart in their mind. And it can cause trouble. You see the word heart and you assume it only means your feelings. And it gives the emotional life way too much attention and power today. You need to try to have good feelings. Like a garden, you need to plant good feelings. But when you concentrate on your feelings, when you give them so much attention, or God forbid you let them lead you, many of you kids are making decisions based on your feelings, not what's right, not what the Bible says. You must learn right now at an early age to not make decisions based upon your feelings. You must learn, you must practice not doing that. The devil will have a field day deceiving people. This is why the Bible says we are to hold fast the form of sound words. Do not let your words be taken away from you. Just as in the French Revolution today, there are many deceivers that are changing our words. And the word heart is a word that has been changed today away from its original meaning. And sometimes it's not a direct change, it just begins to be narrowed so the word no longer has the fullness of meaning that it used to have. Today, in a pop song, follow your heart. The idea is just follow your intuition, follow your gut, follow your instinct, follow your emotions, your feelings. They never really tell you what they mean by it. Now let me show you in the Bible that sometimes in the Bible, your heart, since it means the inside of you, can refer to your feelings. Look at Exodus 4. Is not Aaron the Levite thy brother? He will be glad in his heart. What does that mean? He will be glad in the inside of him. <laughs> the inside. Glad inside. That's what it means. Often it does refer to inner feeling, emotion, or desire. Deuteronomy 19 lest the avenger of blood pursue the slayer while his heart is hot. That means he's angry inside. Heart just means the inside. It refers to the emotion of anger. Judges 19, let thy heart be merry. means let the inside of you be merry. Nehemiah 2, this is nothing else but sorrow of heart, said the king to Nehemiah. Sorrow of heart. This means you are sad inside. That's all it means. So since you do have feelings inside of you, sometimes the heart refers to those feelings. But here is something that people always miss or often miss. The heart as the seat of understanding. So you could take a pop song that says follow your heart and uh, show them that really what they could be saying is follow your mind, follow your reason. Follow your conscience. And of course, that will sober them up real quick because it'll take away the whole zing of everything they're trying to say. What they're trying to tell you to do is be rebellious. They're trying to tell you, go with the world. Don't think about tomorrow. Just do it right now. J just go with your gut instinct. Go with your feeling because you want to hear that. We want to hear that whatever we feel, we should go do. That's why you pay money for the song. 
That's why you get a feel-good feeling from the movie. You want people to tell you, don't listen to your father, don't listen to your pastor, don't listen to authority, just go do it. We all love that message in the flesh. Deuteronomy 6, let me show you something. These words which I command thee this day shall be in thy heart. I believe God wants you to have an emotional love for his words, but the primary meaning here is that you remember his truth in your mind, that you have his words in your mind. The heart meant understanding here, your understanding. Look at Deuteronomy 7. If thou shalt say in thy heart, what does that mean? Say in your mind. Say in your mind. When people talk to themselves, it's primarily their mind talking. Their inside can refer to their mind, their, their understanding. Job 38, look at this one. Who hath put wisdom in the inward parts? Or who hath given understanding to the heart? So we have a King James Bible definition here of what the heart means. It's the inward part, which we've already seen. So understanding to the heart, obviously, it's not talking about your feelings there. Okay? So when you read heart in the Bible, many times, I would say even most of the time, it is not referring to your feelings. You remember that next time. People say, well, I just, my heart is just not in it. Well, get your heart in it. You need to learn how to understand truth. You're confusing your heart with your feelings. And you've been taught by this culture to go with how you feel and you must learn it's part of your maturity it's part of growing up to be a big girl and learn not to follow your feelings Matthew 13 for this people's heart is waxed gross lest at any time they should see with their eyes and should understand with their heart that is not the place of emotion. That is the place of understanding here in the Bible. New Testament. Matthew 24, But and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming. That is in his mind, his understanding. Luke 9, And Jesus perceiving the thought of their heart, not the feeling of their heart, not the affection or passion of their heart, the thought of their heart. Your mind is inside of you. Understand that. Luke 24, then he said unto them, O fools and slow of heart, to believe all that the prophets have spoken. This is talking about your mind, your understanding. Acts chapter 8, Repent, if perhaps the thought of thy heart may be forgiven thee. Not the feelings of your heart, the affection of your heart, the thought of thy heart. Acts 8, 37, Philip said, If thou believest with all thy heart, that is, with your mind, believe with your mind. Hosea 10, the heart is divided. Now shall they be found faulty. You say, well, what does that mean? It means to be double-minded. The Bible speaks of being double-hearted. If you have not a double heart, says the Bible. The Bible sometimes defines it as being double-minded. Th that means being halfway with God and halfway with the world. He doesn't want you lukewarm, does he? God says, if you're not going to grow it long, cut it off. Be bald. God says, if you name the name of Christ, depart from iniquity. Decide what side you're on. If you're going to be out here with this bad crowd, go with them. But get out of the middle. Get out of the middle. Quit trying to say, well, I'm a good person. I just like to dress immodest. I'm a good person. I just like to look like I'm a drug addict. I like to look like I'm a harlot. No, God forbid. Outside and inside, be what God has called you to be. And let's be fully for God. Not having a double mind, a double heart. Look at Romans 10. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. That is, you are believing something. You believe with your mind, folks. Not your foot. Not your nose. Belief is of the mind, of the intellect. The Bible says they assented that these things were so. That is, they believed it. 1 Corinthians 7. Nevertheless, the Father that standeth steadfast in his heart and hath so decreed in his heart that he will keep his virgin, doeth well. This speaks of his mind, his will. 2 Corinthians 9, Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give. Again, we're talking about the mind, the purpose, the will. Hebrews 3, Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you 
an evil heart of unbelief. What is an evil heart of unbelief? It's your mind. It's you not believing God anymore in faith. You believe with your mind. The Bible says, oh, that we might be saved from unreasonable men, for all men have not faith. New Bibles take that out. New Bibles take that out. Hebrews 4, for the word of God is quick, it's living and powerful, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. What is the heart? Many times, most of the time, it has to do with your mind. How often is that taught today? People read their King James Bible even, even a King James Bible. They read it and they see heart and they believe it's talking about your feelings all the time. That is not true. Most of the time it's talking about your mind. 1 Kings 3, I have given thee a wise and an understanding heart. An understanding heart, an understanding inside. The Bible says in Proverbs 10, the wise in heart shall receive commandments. That's not your feelings. Proverbs 11, the fool shall be servant to the wise of heart. Proverbs 22, apply thy heart unto my knowledge. Proverbs 8, ye fools be of an understanding heart. The Bible says Elijah will come and he's going to rebuke this world and he's going to have lots of curses. And one of the things he's going to say is children... You better give your hearts to your fathers. You better turn your heart. That means don't just say yes, sir, with the outside and smile and inside you're not giving your heart to your father. That's being a hypocrite. The Bible says that you need to give your inside to your father. That means be open with him. Be real with him. Honor him. Not just externally, but inside. Be of an understanding heart. All right, I hope you have seen now that the heart simply means the inside. Sometimes in the Bible, it refers to your feelings or emotions. But most of the time in the Bible, it refers to your mind, your intellect, your thinking. So that'll change a lot in this culture when somebody says, well, you just need to follow your heart. Say, what are you talking about? Do you even know what you're saying? What are you telling me when you tell me, follow my heart? Do you even know? You're just picking up something you heard on TV Okay? You, in other words, you don't have any counsel for me and you don't know what to say, so you're just saying this pat answer that everybody uh, turns to. Well, just follow your heart. That's the stupidest thing to tell somebody without telling them what the heart is. Tell them what you mean. That is ridiculous. So the first problem. The first problem is that these verses that I just read to you are ignored by most people. Or is there, there's a blindness concerning them. They read them but they don't really consider this is saying my heart is the place of understanding. So this popular idea of the heart being the intuitive or emotional life is perpetuated. So that's the first problem. They either don't know about these verses that I just read or they have never really considered them. The second problem is that the NIV and other versions pervert many or most of the verses I just read. Isn't that scary? Isn't that scary? I'll just give you a few examples. Here's Luke 9.47 in an NIV. Jesus knowing their thoughts. Jesus knowing their thoughts. What's missing here? What's missing here? The thought of thy heart. So see, the link now that shows you that the heart is the place of thinking has been removed in the NIV. Um, NIV Luke 24.27. How foolish you are and how slow to believe. What did they do? They took out any reference to the heart as the place of understanding. In Acts 37, when it says, uh, If thou believest, thou mayest. If thou believest in thy heart, thou mayest. With all thy heart is what it says. Acts 8.37, there is no Acts 8.37 in a New Bible version. Primarily because Catholics in their manuscripts did not want you to understand Acts 8.37 because they want you to be baptized as a baby whether you believe or not. That very important verse in Job 36, 38. Wow, what a defining verse that was. Let's read it in the King James Bible. Who hath put wisdom in the inward parts, or who hath given understanding to the heart? Wow, we need that verse, don't we? The NIV defines it as this. Who gives the ibis wisdom or gives the rooster understanding? Well, there you go. Don't you tell me that these Bibles are pretty much the same. Whoever says that has never compared them, okay? You don't know what you're talking about. So, praise God that you have a Bible, children. 
Praise God that you have a standard, an objective standard, an infallible standard. So the NIV and these other Bibles, they get rid of the link, at least in many verses, between the heart and the place of understanding. And sometimes you need... See, so what they do is they take a new Bible and they say, well, I found it over here in one place. Well, if God put it in ten places, you needed it in ten places. Okay? It's like a needle in a haystack. That's a big Bible. How often do you read it? You don't read it enough. They say, well, it's over here one or two or three times. Well, if God put it there 20 times, you need it there 20 times. Peter said you need to be reminded. So the first thing is they don't even know these verses are in the Bible. The second problem is the new versions that everybody's turning to are changing doctrine. They're, they're deleting the link between the heart and the place of understanding. So now when you hear the pop song or you get out here in the culture and you're told, follow your heart, now heart in your mind just means one thing, what I feel, what I feel. Dangerous, very, very dangerous. The third problem. When all this is tied together, the third problem is that new versions remove almost everything dealing with reason, study, understanding, infallible proof, etc. I document this in my book, The Word, God Will Keep It. I show you new Bible versions and I show you, I go through just about every verse dealing with study, thinking, reason, that we might be saved from unreasonable man. Boom, out, out in the new version. God says, come let us reason together. No longer in the new version. Study to show yourself approved. No longer in the new versions. By many infallible proofs. No longer in the new versions. Anything dealing with absolute truth. Anything dealing with objective thinking. Experiential religion that's subjective without any absolutes or preserved infallible objective standards received through the understanding. In other words, the modern colleges of America where every class you go to, no matter what it is, architecture, political science, the college professor says there is no absolute truth. There is no absolute truth. They do not want you to believe there are objective standards. It comes from the hippie relativism. It's really communism that wants to destroy your objective standard so the state becomes your authority or whatever propaganda they want to feed you. The result is this. Your mind is usurped by emotional. Everyone proclaims that the heart must take precedent over the head. Everywhere you go, this is what you hear today. And why is it all dangerous? If you go to 19th century books on divine guidance, for example, I'm not talking cultic material, I'm talking just Christian books on how to know God's will. Unlike today, they warn that you must first be guided by fact and then feelings. It's the Bible, reason, then intuition, or emotion. That order. They stress it over and over and over, and they say if you ever reverse this order, if you ever reverse this order, you need Bible, reason, and then feelings. That's how you're guided. In other words, if you're guided to do anything and your reason goes against it, you need to search the Scriptures and you need to pause. If you're guided to do anything by your mind and it goes against the scriptures you need to obviously repent and change direction they warn that if you get this out of order it's satanic and deceptive but today this is turned backwards everywhere you turn you're told to follow your heart and they really do come out and tell you they mean not your head not your reason and they certainly don't mean the king james bible they do not mean... When you go to Broadway Baptist in Fort Worth, God forbid, but I debated the pastor one time, that's the church that allows homosexual sodomites uh, in their church and in their choir and, and etc. And the pastor told me plainly, I said, what are you doing? And I read the scriptures to him. He says, wait a minute, stop. My Jesus is in heaven. See, that's where my guide is. We follow the word that's in heaven. I said, that's real convenient. How does he communicate to you? See... I follow Jesus too, but this is his authority right here. This is, the, this is the King James Bible. This is his authority where the word of the king, there's power, says the Bible. There it is right here, our holy Bible. This is Jesus talking to me. This is the Lord Jesus talking to you. But you want to reject that for a subjective authority. 
Basically, you get to do whatever you want and say Jesus agrees with it. That's the problem with this charismania that has invaded even Baptist churches. Everybody's like, well, you've got to follow the Spirit. What's the Spirit telling you to do? Sometimes that's just a synonym for your own heart, which ends up being just your feelings. It ends up being just your feelings. I believe the Spirit does lead us. But you better search the Scriptures and see how the Spirit leads you. He's not going to lead you to follow your feelings up above or contrary to the Word of God or contrary to, to that which is reasonable, enlightened by the Word of God. It's very important that you understand this. God is often commanding things that are higher than our understanding. But we can be anchored and trust God that no matter what I feel about it, even what I think about it, if it's in the book, it's true and we need to follow it. But people are walking in adultery today because they followed the Spirit, but it's not the Spirit of the Bible. It's another Spirit that agreed with their flesh. you got kids disobeying parents today, fathers, because they're following their flesh and they think they're following the Spirit. New Agers like Shakti Gawan, devil-possessed, in her book, Living in the Light, she says that the realm of intuition and the realm of emotion is feminine and the realm of understanding is pictured as masculine. She says the key to all guidance is to make sure your feminine is in the guiding position. Never let the masculine be in the guiding position. Now, what she may not know is our King James Bible says that the spirit, the realm of your intellect, is masculine in picture. And the soul, the realm of your affections and desires, is feminine in picture. Psalms 34, verse 2, My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. Well, the Bible's clear. The masculine is to be an authority over the feminine. It doesn't mean there's no purpose for the feminine. It means you are to put the masculine in the guiding position in the home. The masculine is to be in the guiding position. Women, wives, submit to your husbands. So what does this Shakti Gawan, New Ager, devil-possessed woman say? She says, always go with the feminine. Go with your feelings above your reason. So the KJV Bible takes what they have perverted and places it right side up. We should be guided by our mind as it is renewed more and more by the Holy Scriptures. And that will help you in regard to your feelings. Because your feelings scream out. Your desires, they scream out, obey, obey. Your feelings are the feelings of your body as well as the feelings of your flesh or inward soul. You have many desires, physical, emotional. And sometimes these seem so right. In fact, the adulteress, one of the things she says to the man is don't even think about it. Don't think about it. Just go with the feeling. Don't think about tomorrow. Don't think about what you're doing to God and doing to somebody else. Don't think about what you're doing to your children. Just go with it. Don't think about it. Just go with the feeling. That is so contrary to the Bible and that is satanic. From the very beginning in the Garden of Eden, what did Satan say to Eve? What did he lead her to do? To look at how good the food looks, so-called food. To look at the tree, that the forbidden tree. Uh, to look at it, to gaze at it. She was led by her emotional life, not led by her reason. She wasn't led by fact, that's for sure. She wasn't led by the Word of God, that's for sure. So the devil comes to get you occupied with the flesh, that you make decisions based upon the flesh. And then he'll teach you to get high and mighty and self-righteous where you say, well, that's just me. You want me to dress in a way that's not me. 
You want me to do things that is just not me. That's just not my way. I've got to do things my way. Otherwise, I'm being a hypocrite. Folks, you better learn something right now. God has standards on just about everything. And the key to growing up and being wise and being yourself more than you could ever be yourself is to follow what God says about everything. Because He made you. If He says He wants you to have long hair as a woman, well, you go have long hair as a woman. If He says He wants you to be modest as a woman, well, you go be modest as a woman. If He says not to get tattoos as a man or a woman, then you don't get tattoos. You say, well, that's just my way. Well, your way's perverted. Let God teach you how to be you. Let God teach you what His purpose for you has been from the beginning. Be what God wants you to be. Look at Proverbs 20. The spirit of man is the candle of the Lord, searching all the inward parts of the belly. This word search, uh, as we see... He that is first in his own cause seemeth just, but his neighbor comes and searches him. It means to cross-examine something. It means to put it to the test. So what is it saying? It says God gave you your mind, your ability to think, so you can discern and search and test the feelings of your belly. Your belly says, I want to eat that. Yes, I do. But the mind says, don't do that. It's got MSG and BPA and antibiotics and poisons and pesticides and a whole bunch of other junk in it. You don't want to eat that. You don't want to do that. But your flesh is saying, don't even think about it. A little bit won't hurt. Let's just go eat it. Let's just eat it. And then you do that over and over again. No wonder you're sick. No wonder you've got problems. Because guess what? You're not eating for strength. You're not eating in wisdom. You're letting your flesh rule what you stick in your mouth, just like Eve did from the very beginning. She let her flesh decide what she stuck in her mouth. God wants you to enjoy food, and He gives you a bunch of wonderful things to enjoy. He gives you a lot of good times in this life. He wants you to enjoy your youth. He gives us a lot of fun and enjoyable things in this life, and He wants you to go rejoice and have fun in those things. But He wants you to use your mind, this candle, to search whether or not your desires are right. You say, why are you doing that, kid? Because I want to. Because I feel like it. God forbid. Now, here's the problem. Sometimes your candle, your mind, does not shine very brightly. In fact, a lot of people's lamp has been put out. This is why you go to church, that I might enlighten with the Word of God through preaching your candle. This is why you study the Word of God at home and have your devotional time with your family and personally, so your candle can be lit. So then when you, make, when you go to test your feelings... You are not dealing with a candle that's barely lit. See, you get in this Word of God, you get prayed up and you study the Scriptures. Now your candle's shining, your flashlight is shining. And now when your flesh says, I want to go over here, you're able to say, no, that's not of God. The Bible says, obey your parent. The Bible says, do this. The Bible says, not be unreasonable. Folks, if you're going to follow your feelings, how do you get up in the morning? Because your feelings are going to tell you to stay in bed, isn't it? Your feelings are going to tell you all kinds of things that you know are not right. <clears throat> so how do we get our candle lit? The Bible says in Psalms 18, For thou wilt light my candle. The Lord my God will enlighten my darkness. How does God do it? <coughs> Psalms 119, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. So what do we find here, folks? You get in the Bible. You say, and you let people help you. And say, hey, if, where is it in the Bible about so-and-so? And you begin to study the Scriptures and you grow and you say, no, it says it right here. I know what I'm going to do. It says obey your father. It says to, to obey your husband. It says to do that. I know what I'm going to do now. It says right here in the Word what I'm to do. Oh, it sure does seem right for me to do opposite of what the Bible is telling me to do. The Bible, in fact, the Bible tells me to discipline my child or I hate them. But oh, when they begin to cry and whimper and that cute little toddler looks at you, oh, I'm telling you, everything inside of a man says, oh, just give him a chance. Don't spank him. Don't, don't, don't discipline your child. And then you end up with a spoiled brat. You say, how did that happen? Well, one little spoiled incident over and over and over and over, and pretty soon you blink and you've lost that time. You've lost that time to raise your child. And you raised a brat. You raised a spoiled child now. And that's going to be hard to ever get back. Somebody takes your child away from you when, when they're 12 years old or 13 years old at a, at a transition time. You might never get that child back. See, 
You needed to be there as the father when they go around that corner to help them as they start experiencing those teen years. See, you need to be there to check that and help them so they don't grow crooked and bent and perverted. It's the Word of God that shows us what to do. Sing a song about following the Word of God, following the King James Bible. But no, they sing songs about following your heart. Following your heart. Let's hear what God thinks about this whole thing. Proverbs 18, A fool hath no delight in understanding, but that his heart may discover itself. You know what the fool wants to do? To discover himself. I want to find out who I am. I'm sorry, Daddy. I must go find out who I am. I'm sorry. I must leave my marriage. i got to find out who I am. Well, says the fool. Why don't you be who God wants you to be from the Word of God? Why don't you be what God says you ought to be from the Word of God? It's the fool that wants to go discover his heart. You've had enough time in this world to know what's inside your heart. What about this one? Proverbs 28. He that trusteth in his own heart is a fool. Jeremiah 17. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? People say, I just want to follow my heart because I know what my heart wants me to do. You don't, even, you don't know what's inside. You, you're a conflicted bag of emotions with all types of desires, some of them crisscross, the conscience telling you to do one thing, your understanding telling you to do one thing, your desires telling you to do something else. You're just a big bundle of emotions. And usually it ends up wicked, wicked. There's definitely wickedness down there, desperately wicked. You better be careful. The psychologist says, well, let's go into your inner being, your inner heart, and let's find out what you ought to be and what you ought to do. God forbid. God forbid. Proverbs 14. There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the way thereof, the end thereof, are the ways of death. People say, well, it just seems right to me. Well, of course it seems right. We're born wrong. Do you know you're born a liar, says the Bible? Do you know you come out all crooked and messed up? Don't get this idea a child is just this bundle of perfection. And, and that, you know, you might think it's cute, but you'll see real early You'll see a child as a little toddler crying in the crib, crying in the crib, and then you sneak around the corner and look. And you'll see them open one eye and stop crying and look around to try to see if they've got anybody's attention, to try to see if anybody's coming. And then they'll just sit and put on a face like they're just crying. And How does a child know that? How does a child know to be a liar and manipulative like that? They're not really crying. They're crying because they want to just get out of the crib. How does a child know that? You think that's cute, but just think about that. That shows that we are born wrong in many ways. You need to be trained up in the way that you should go. And the Bible says foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction will drive it far from them. Many of you might have been raised in a way where that foolishness never, never left you. You never had it driven from you. And you are just messed up. You're messed up as a person now that you're an adult. You're just messed up. And you think whatever way you want to go, you're going to do it. And you're just stubborn and you're perverse. And you make decisions based upon what you want to do, not based upon what God says in the Bible. You're not a person that's, that, that's driven by principle. Let's just do the right thing. I don't have to make a decision. Daniel, they said, don't pray or you'll go to jail and you'll end up executed. Daniel opened up his windows and began to pray. He said, I don't have to think about this thing. His three friends told the king about bowing down to that image. We're not careful to answer you about this thing. This isn't something we don't need to think about. This isn't anything we need to think about. We will not bow down to your... And whether God save us, I don't know. Maybe He will. But get one thing straight. We will not be bowing down. We will not be bowing down to your image. So trust in the Lord with all thy heart. Lean not to thy own understanding. 
If your own understanding can be dangerous, how much more your feelings? Have you ever thought about that? If your understanding is dangerous, how much more your feelings? Here's what's inside your heart that everybody's telling you to follow. Mark 7, For from within, out of the heart of men, Proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornication, murders, thefts, covetous, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, that's immodesty, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. You know where all that backsliding comes from? Because somebody followed their heart. You think about that now. You know where that adultery come from? Somebody followed their heart. You know where that abortion came from, a murdering that little baby? Somebody followed their heart. They stole something. They coveted. They were wicked. They are immodest, lascivious. Where does it all come from? Their heart. Their heart. And somebody's telling you to follow that. Somebody comes along, puts a little bit of icing on it, and says, oh, this is really the Holy Spirit. See, whatever you feel inside is really just the Holy Spirit talking to you. So follow the Spirit, and they'll whisper when they say Spirit to try to be all religious, you know. And you're like, yeah, it sure is dry following the Bible. It sure does go against my flesh following the Bible. How boring that is. But how exciting it is to follow my flesh and call it the Holy Spirit or call it my heart. This has been in the hippie culture and in music, pop music and rock music, certainly since the 50s and 60s. Here's the Manhattans in 1965, the song Follow Your Heart. My mind tells me to forget her. It's a puzzling thing. My heart says love her. Follow your heart, boy. Yeah. Follow your heart, boy. Yeah. That's all you need to marry somebody that your mind's telling you don't marry her. You're going to end up cursed. But your heart says marry her. It'll be all right. Simple Man was a southern anthem that I grew up with. 1973. One of the most popular songs of the South. Had some pretty decent lyrics, but listen to this line. Oh, take your time. Don't live too fast. Troubles will come and they will pass. You'll find a woman and you'll find love. And don't forget, son, there is someone up above. So far, pretty good. Boy, don't worry. You'll find yourself. Follow your heart and nothing else. Now, wait a second here. What do you mean by that? What do you mean by that? What do you mean find yourself? The Bible says the fool wants to find himself. What do you mean follow your heart and nothing else? Follow my heart? My heart will tell me to do all kinds of things if you mean my flesh, if you mean my desires, if you mean my passion. That's what got me in a lot of trouble. I did follow my heart. I did obey this song. Praise God, by 23 I realized how stupid that was and how wicked and what destruction it had wrought in my life and in the lives of others by following my heart as this song said to do. Then you have Triumph, which was supposed to be a semi-Christian band, you know, a rock band, 1984. Ten years later, it doesn't stop. Rock and roll lives and breathes in the hearts of the young. Oh, that's a nice lyric. So carry on. Follow your heart. You've got to follow your heart. Living for today, forget about tomorrow. Any other way will only lead to sorrow. Listen to the rhythm. Your heart won't lie. Do you see why when they say rock and roll is Satan talking? When David Bowie and those others said, of course rock music is satanic. What, what, are you an idiot? Of course we're satanic. Of course this is the devil talking. That's right out of Genesis 3, folks. That's what you need to hear when you're full of hormones. The alcohol is starting to affect your reason and your judgment. And then you put this song on that says, don't worry about tomorrow, just live for today. No wonder you lost your purity. No wonder you end up cursed. No wonder you're pregnant now out of wedlock. No wonder you're having trouble. You need to turn this trash off. You understand that's satanic. It's a satanic message. But don't worry. You say, I'm not listening to rock bands. Oh, don't worry. Your mama will, will try to figure out what to do with you, so she'll turn the video on so the little child can sit in front of the television and watch Thumbelina the movie. It's rated G, so it's okay. And here's the little song, the climax of this whole thing. You're sure to do impossible things if you follow your heart. 
a nice little creature, telling Thumbelina, your dreams will fly on magical wings when you follow your heart. You don't need a chart to guide you. You mean like the King James Bible over there? Like, like a chart, something objective? I don't need a chart to guide me. Close your eyes and look inside of you. Hey, folks. The hippies are a bunch of old men sitting around producing Disney movies now. Okay? They've got an agenda. They've got an agenda. It's a satanic agenda. See... When the fellow that started the Church of Satan, when he said you could go watch a Hollywood movie and that is a satanic ritual, just turn on the television. You don't got to go to a satanic church. Just turn on the television. This is what he's talking about. This is what he means. You don't have to have the word Lucifer there. They've got the word magic there. That should tell you enough. But just to tell you to just close your eyes. The devil didn't come to Eve and say, I'm Satan, follow the serpent. No, no, he came and just said, close your eyes and follow your heart and do what you want to do. There is no pain. There is no death. Thou shalt not surely die. You'll be as gods. What is this saying? You're going to be like a god. Your dreams will fly on magical wings. Here's the Scorpions, 2013. What's the title of their song? Follow your heart. This is the time for yourself to be free. you got to follow your heart. You'll be at home where your heart is. This is the only road to go. So television show after television show, lifetime movie after lifetime movie, uh, you know, Harlequin romance, whatever it is, uh, every pop song, rock song, everywhere you turn, this is what kids are being told. And usually the climax of the movie is that the father's there to say, don't follow your heart, don't do this, and they're holding you back. And so the climax of the movie where everything explodes and comes to fruition is when you rebel against your father and you find yourself and everything goes so well for you and it's all blessed. And by the end of the movie, here comes dad saying, I apologize, I was holding you back. See, over and over and over and over and over. I've documented this before. Disney movie after Disney movie. Same theme, same theme, same theme. You know where the thing's going. It's the same story over and over and over. You've got to follow your feelings. Don't obey your dad. Don't listen to your husband. Don't listen to your pastor. Obey your feelings and you'll find yourself. And you'll be blessed. There's an obvious pushback against this, Okay. This is such common sense wrong. I mean, it's so basically wrong that there is a pushback in just about all circles of Christianity and even the world against this stupidity. There's a great pushback against this. Here's a Christian song. Mainstream Christian CCM. I'm not a fan of the music here, but they've got some pretty decent lyrics. Anthem Lights in 2014, they have a song called Follow Your Heart. They say, some say follow your own heart and it will never lead you astray. Some say chase your own dreams. That's all that matters anyway. Well, I've been there. I've done that. I've tried that. I lived that. And I came back and found out truth is, turns out, to get me where I'm meant to be, I've got to follow your heart. If anything is going to count in this life, let my only prayer be to follow your heart. Let me follow your heart. And we assume they're talking about God and not Satan. Follow God's heart. Follow God's heart. See, instead of telling everybody to follow your heart, how about follow God's heart? Isn't that the key to life? Isn't that the key to blessing? If you could improve upon this song, it would be to define how to follow God's heart. Because a lot of people think they are following God's heart when they follow their own heart. They think God's within them in some way that is, they think they're divine, like Shirley MacLaine or Oprah Winfrey. It'd be great to clarify that. Hey, follow a King James Bible. Follow your heart in the Bible. Here's John Bloom of DesiringGod.org. Follow your heart is a creed embraced by billions of people. It's a statement of faith in one of the great pop cultural myths of the Western world. For lost people, it's a tempting gospel to believe. Until you consider that your heart has sociopathic tendencies, what does your heart tell you? Please don't answer. My heart tells me that all of reality ought to serve my desires. No one lies to us more than our own hearts. These aren't some fundamentalist Christians I'm telling you here, folk. 
I, I'm telling you, th- th- this is Hannah Whittle Smith, uh, The Christian Secret to a Happy Life. Th- this is just basic common sense, okay? Th- th- this is basic churchianity out here. If you can't, as a Christian, get this basic belief, you are so far gone in your Christian life. You understand? These people that go out here and cheat and, and leave their spouses and get drunk, and they say, well, I'm following the heart. That is so Sunday school. Even a four-year-old could tell you, you know what? You're a big girl. You ought not be following your feelings like this, okay? That's ridiculous, Mom. That's ridiculous, brother. That's ridiculous, Father. Here's RelevantMagazine.com. Culture tells us this is the ultimate determiner in making decisions. What is your heart telling you to do? How horrifically dangerous is it to follow our feelings, desires, and emotion? The battle is always remembering truth. I strive to teach my children. And sometimes it seems as if you're being rude when you say it doesn't matter how you feel. Do you understand what we're trying to tell you when we say it doesn't matter how you feel? What we're trying to get you to do is look at an objective standard, okay? It's not how you feel about things in life. It's what's right. What's true? What does God command you? That's the only thing you need to be concerned about. Your feelings will change when you begin to do the right thing. At first, you're not going to like it. The Bible says that that, that nobody straightway likes the the new wine. You're not going to like it immediately. It's going to feel very awkward. But when you start doing right because it's right, pretty soon right begins to feel right. Isn't that a blessing? See, there's a way that seems right to a man, but it's the the end thereof is death. But listen to me, little ones, you start doing right because it's right, pretty soon you like being right. It feels good. And you get peace and you get rest to your soul that you never had over on the other side. Here's why am I today, Ashley Ashcroft. We've heard it a million times. We've read it in our Instagram feed, our coffee mugs, T-shirts, artwork, even in Christian bookstores. Follow your heart. But is it right to follow my heart? Will following my heart even make me happy? There have definitely been times I regretted following my heart. I followed my heart to indulge in a big meal, for example. But instead of happiness, I got a tummy ache. I've also followed my heart into a relationship that ended in sadness instead of happiness. Scripture tells us that the heart is deceitful. Ultimately, the driving force in our lives should be our faith, what we know to be true, what we trust regardless of how we feel. If we were always following our hearts, doing what we want, and doing it our way, Where would sacrifice come in? Can we truly be disciples of Christ and still get our way all the time? He says, lay your body down as a living sacrifice based on the mercies that God has given you. I beseech you by the mercies of God, present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable. So that's your reasonable service. God says, what are you talking about? You're bought with a price. God's saying, you don't have a will in this matter. The only will you have is to freely submit to me and do what I want you to do. That's what God's saying. Who does he think he is? God? As a matter of fact, he does. He is God. Amen. He has a right to tell you, do what he says to do. He made you for himself, not for yourself. You only get to enjoy yourself ever when you are submitted to him. So if it's a sacrifice, it means it's going to hurt to lay down your body to his will. Paul says, I wrestle with my body to keep it under so it doesn't boss me around. If he's wrestling with his body and keeping it under submission, under subjection, then obviously his body goes against what he should be doing a lot of times. Our inner soul goes against what we should be doing many times. you got to fight it. It hurts to go against your soul. It hurts to go against your flesh. But we need to be big boys and girls. We need to be big boys and girls. You do it because it's right. You do it because it's true. You do it because God said to do it. Noah says, I'm going to run and build an ark. Why did he do that? Because God says it's going to rain. You're going to drown if you don't do it. So he took off running. At first, Jonah says, I don't feel like going and preaching to those people. I'm mad at them. I hope they do be killed and judged. Then he ended up. The Bible says he opened his eyes in hell. The Bible says that out of hell, he began to pray. The Bible says he went into the belly of that well and way down into the bottom of the sea. And I tell you, when Jonah came out, he says, I'll go where God told me to go. See, you get some fear of God in you, and you don't care what your flesh says anymore. You go where God told you to go. Amen? That's the difference between a Christian that's been whipped by God and is repentant and a Christian that hadn't yet tested God. See, the Christian that, that's out here and been tested and been broken and been spanked by God, they said, I'm not touching that. You go do that. I'm not doing that. You're a fool. No way. I tried that. Uh-uh. You just obey God. 
and they'll call you all kinds of names. You know, they'll laugh at you and mock you. They'll say you're not being spiritual. You're not following the spirit. You're being legalistic. No, give me the book. Give me what the book says. What God says is what's right. What God says is what we ought to do. What God says about homosexuality, that's what I believe. What God says about adultery, that's what I believe. What God says about divorcing your wife or husband, that's what I believe. What God says about modesty, that's what I believe. What God says about hair, that's what I believe. What God says about tattoos, that's what I believe. And that's what you ought to believe. Greg Laurie recently wrote an article in World Net Daily about not following your heart. I was already thinking about doing this sermon. I'm like, I'm really glad he did that. I'm glad this message is continuing in mainstream Christianity. Just this basic message needs to be taught everywhere. The problem is once you get people coming to the Bible, you've got to find out what the Bible is. Because the devil's waiting there to say, oh, here's a Catholic Bible. Here's a homosexual Bible. Here's a New Age Bible. Yes, yes, you need to follow the Bible, not your feelings, but then he gives you a new Bible. But most people aren't even there. If you could get them to the point of at least trying to follow the Bible, I mean, you, you've won half the battle at least. You've got to get them to quit following their feelings. They don't even care what the Bible is. They don't care what's in the book because they've been taught from the time they're a child not to follow the map, not to follow the chart. Just follow whatever the fairy says. Follow whatever you feel like doing in your heart. Greg Laurie says, don't go with your heart because it can mislead you. Don't go with your emotions because they can mislead you. And certainly don't go with the culture because that will mislead you. The Bible said don't follow the majority. The Bible says don't, don't be hand in hand with the majority in a wrong thing. Go with the Bible, says Greg Laurie. It will never take you in the wrong direction. Learn to think biblically. I think all of you kids can say, you know what, I've got to learn to think biblically about life. Should I stay? Should I go? Should I do this? Should I stop going to my church? Should I do this? Should I dress this way? Should I act this way? Think biblically. Think biblically. Learn to go to your father and say, Dad, what's your will for me? And Dad, do you mind if I do it this way? Learn to honor your father. Learn to go to your pastor and say, here's what I think is biblical. Do you see anything else in the Bible that I might be missing? Boy, that would be smart, wouldn't it? Maybe I can't see anything different. But maybe I can. Maybe I can show you another way of looking at something in the Word of God with my experience in the Word of God. Learn to be wise that way. You know what people do today? They think they're spiritual because they say, well, I prayed about it. You're leaving your spouse and you're, you're, you're with somebody else's husband or wife. What are you doing? I prayed about it. God says it's okay. You liar from hell. And that's where you're going. Who told you that's okay? Who told you that's okay? I prayed about it. You show me in the word of God where it says pray and you will automatically find guidance. I think you should pray about things. I think you should ask for God's wisdom. But he never said use prayer as the lamp unto your feet. Never once did he said that. He said that Bible is the, the, the lamp unto your feet. You understand that? It's the Mormon that knocks on your door that believes that Satan is, Lucifer is uh, Jesus' brother, that believes you can be a god, that believes Adam was a god. And it's that Mormon that knocks on your door and says, here's a book. Do you believe if you pray your heavenly father, if you ask for wisdom from the heavenly father, will he give it to you? Well, what fool's going to say no? No, every person's going to say yeah. Then they say, well, then go read this right here in the book of Mormon. And we're going to come back knock on your door. And ask God to give you wisdom as you read this. So they ask God to give them wisdom. All of a sudden, they get a burning sensation in their heart. And they're like, whoa, that was strange. They come back at the door. They say, what happened? Did you ask the Heavenly Father for wisdom? They said, I did. And they said, okay, did you read what I told you? They said, I did. They say, well, what happened? They said, I got a burning sensation. Ah, that was God's sign to show you we're true. And many people joined the Mormon church because of that. Our Bible said there's going to be false prophets. And if they speak not according to this word, there is no light in them. The Bible said test them, try the spirits to see if they are of God by the word of God. You need to try everything by the word of God, everything you feel, everything somebody tells you by the word of God. They tried the Apostle Paul, the Bereans did by the word of God. Even the Jews understand this to some degree. Here's Prager University, conservatives. 
this person. I'm not sure what he believed. But uh, he's got this right. In Prager U, don't follow your passion. You can look at it on YouTube. It says never follow your passion, but always bring it with you. And he has a whole little video about how stupid it is to follow your passion. Here's a TED Talk by Terry Trespicio. Stop searching for your passion. She gets up and argues and says, feelings change, we know this, yet we continue to use passion as the yardstick. She talks about how stupid it is as a young person. So what's your passion in life? I don't know what my passion in life is. What would be your passionate job, you know? Go, go, go do what your passion is. Follow your heart. Some of these videos talk about a person that said, you know what, I found out what nobody wanted to do, and, and, and he ended up with thousands and thousands of dollars and prospering. What did he do? He said, I'm going to go clean septic tanks. Nobody else wants to do that. Everybody's following their passion, and, and, and they're going and majoring in art in the, in, in the university or whatever their passion is, and they don't have jobs right now. He said, forget that. I'm going to go clean septic tanks. And he ended up with thousands and thousands of dollars and prospering. See, sometimes it's not following your passion. It's, it's finding a way to, to make money. And, and then so you can do your passion. You can fund your hobbies. You can fund your passion by working somewhere maybe you don't want to work, you know. Uh, let's conclude all of this by looking at a few verses, and I'll close. Psalms 119.9. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? That's really the question, isn't it? Somebody says, what should I do in life? You're asking the wrong question. The question is, how are you going to clean up your life? Hey, young person, how are you going to clean your life up? That's the question. That's the one thing you need to be concerned about right now. How am I going to clean up the mess I've made? Not by following your passion, not by following your heart, but by taking heed thereto according to thy word. The Bible does say follow the Lord. The Bible does say follow righteousness. The Bible does say follow godliness according to the word of God. But it never says follow your heart. It certainly doesn't say follow your feelings. And it certainly doesn't say follow your flesh. Or follow the devil. Or follow the world. This is what the way of the wicked does. Proverbs 15, the way of the wicked is an abomination unto the Lord. Why? Because they follow their heart. They're fools. But he loveth him that followeth after righteousness. You want God to love you in this special way. God loves you. You better believe. He loves you. He loves all mankind. He loves all believers. But there's a special way he loves you when you're obedient. Correction is grievous unto him that forsaketh the way, and he that hateth reproof shall die. Well, that's the way of the wicked. Now let me end with saying one thing here. For just a moment, I'm going to let you know that inside of you, sometimes there is truth. Sometimes you do have a conscience. Sometimes you do know what's right deep inside of you. And you know what the Bible says? In one sense, that's your true self. Now, I know when people say find yourself, they don't mean find that. <laughs> that's the thing they want you to suppress. But if there's any truth to ever finding yourself, if there's any truth to the old saying, to thy own self first, be true, here's what it means. It means follow that little bit of light in you that says, you know what? I should be obeying that Bible. I should be obeying what God said in that book. Hey, deep down, that's the true you. Deep down. When, when you see a Christian and they're backslidden, they're a mess, and they've lost their joy, they've lost their smile, they've lost their testimony, sometimes I'll say to them, this isn't you. This isn't you. I'm not being psycho, psychological with them or psychobabble. What I'm saying, this isn't you. You're going to regret this one day. This isn't you. This is what the devil wants you to be. It's not what God wants you to be. As C.S. Lewis says, when you give yourself to God, you find yourself more than you have ever could have ever found yourself following the devil in the world. Let me show you what's inside of you. Ecclesiastes 9, the heart of the sons of men is full of evil and madness is in their heart while they live. Now, if madness is inside of you, that means you've suppressed something. That means you're following something in you, but yet there's something else inside of you that you've buried deep down. That's what madness is. 
As Barnes says, they are estranged from God and led by the influence of evil passions. Listen to this. Contrary to their better judgment and the decisions of a sound mind. Deep down inside you, the Bible says, God lighteth every man that cometh into the world. You got a conscience. Now you can sear that conscience. You can make it where it's kind of broken. But I'm going to tell you, deep down, that's why God could go to Paul and say it's hard to kick against the pricks, isn't it? What was pricking him? Ever since Stephen laid down, ever since they laid down that garment of Stephen's at his feet, something was pricking Saul. Something inside of Saul. And there's something inside of you, especially if you've grown up in a Christian home with a King James Bible, with a daddy that's teaching you the Bible. There's something inside of you, and it's there. And I'm telling you, that's more you than anything the world could ever make you be. That is more the real you than anything you try to do for yourself by following your feelings. <clears throat> but sometimes you suppress that self, and that's what madness is. There's some people that have gone plumb crazy, people, because they've taken that part of themselves and they've suppressed it down and buried it. That's what they thought Jesus had, did, had done. In Mark 3, it says, And when his friends heard of it, they went out to lay hold on him, for they said, He is beside himself. What's it mean to beside yourself? It means your real self is over here, but you're over here. You're walking in this, which is not you. That's what mad people do. That's what crazy people do. It means to be beside your reason and no longer walking in your reason. Now listen to this and I close. Luke 15. When the prodigal son, when he came to himself. You ever thought about those words? When he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my fathers have bread enough and to spare and I perish with hunger? And he went to his father's house says, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in thy sight. Forgive me, make me as one of thy hired servants. Poole says, every sinner is beside himself. He's governed by appetite. What did that prodigal son get in touch with? Did he get in touch with his feelings? No, he got in touch with his feelings. That made him leave the ranch to begin with and want to go after a bunch of harlots and waste all his money partying. So the prodigal heard all these voices he heard all the pop song. He was singing them and whistling them as he rode his donkey wherever he was going into the far country. Follow your heart. You got to follow your heart. Boy, you got to follow your passion. My father wants me to sit around and plow, you know, all that kind of. No, I, I want to go party, man. I got to go see the world. I don't care that I broke his heart. I'm going to go waste my money, find me some loose women, get drunk. I got to do what I want to do. I can't be a clone of my dad. I got to be what I want to do. I got to be my own self. Yeah, that's a good boy. And all the people around you that are partying and using your money. Yeah, that's right. You, you, you had a legalistic upbringing back there. Yeah, you, I tell you what, I'm so glad you escaped from that. I'm so glad that you flied away, fled away. Oh, how wonderful it is to be free. But one day that prodigal came to sobriety. and He realized, you know what, this isn't me. This isn't me. This is not me. God forbid, I want to go back home. I want to go back and get right with God. This isn't me. This is stupid. And he began to listen to his conscience and listen to his true self. And he became more of himself than he ever was in his life. Dear Holy Father, we do pray in the name of the Lord Jesus that you help us. Thank you for your goodness toward us. Help these children, Lord, learn divine guidance. Help them learn not to follow their feelings or their own self-will. Help them learn not to go the way that seemeth right to a man that feels right. Help them start learning right now to practice doing what's right because it's right. Help them learn to go to their father and say, Daddy, what's right? Help me figure out what's right. That's all I want to do is what's right. Help these adults here, Lord. Help us all to be totally surrendered unto you, Father, that our prayers might be answered, that you might bless us. And that you'll be pleased with us, God. Let us quit holding back that little part. Let that sin be surrendered, Lord. Let that part of our life where we think we're good enough already without surrendering it, God. Let it be surrendered today on the altar. I do pray you help us. And bless these young people. We thank you for the blood of Jesus. We thank you for the Holy Bible, the King James Bible. In Jesus' name, amen.